Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the latest Shiny Podcast. This is your host, Stephen Spector. And with me, as usual, is uh, Rob Hirschfeld. Good morning, Rob. Stephen, hello. We have, we have the Austin contingent uh, today. I'm excited yeah. about this. Yes, our guest is from Austin, and uh, they, they make me feel somewhat guilty for not living there anymore. But I am sure it's over 100 degrees today in Austin. So <laughs> I'm... I am okay. It, it hasn't hit 70. <laughs> it's cool up north. But uh, let's go ahead and introduce our guest. He's the head of product and strategy at Hangar Technology, Richard Primo. Richard, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure. And it will be 100 today. I can yeah. guarantee it. <laughs> I don't miss that anymore. So, Richard, <laughs> why don't you just give us a short little uh, background about yourself, and then we'll jump into learning about your technology and, and of course, your edge I'm very excited. This is a great Edge podcast for us. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, we're delighted to talk about uh, what we're doing here. We feel like we're pushing the envelope of a lot of different uh, technologies and perspectives on it. Um, I am a startup junkie. I've been doing it for about 30 years, and uh, this is my third startup with our current CEO here, Jeff Deco. We're about, Hangar's about uh, almost 18 months old now. We have built a, a pretty incredible platform. We call it Robotics as a System. We have been participating with uh, Vapor and Crown Castle and Project Volatus with the Kinetic Edge. And uh, our vision for that Kinetic Edge is uh, going to be quite uh, exciting, I think. Uh, everybody's been thinking about autonomous vehicles, but we don't think they've been thinking about the right ones first. There's a ton to unpack because you, you, named, you named a whole bunch of vendors and projects. And, and one of the things that I would, I would suggest people do is go back to the Matt Trafira podcast that we recorded a, a couple of weeks ago. It will give you some idea of Crown Castle, Vapor, he's with Vapor, some of what, what's going on. We have a tendency to tell people to listen to other podcasts as homework. Um, and we'll assume people would do that here to give you some background on sort of this edge industry that, that's been forming. And so I want to jump straight to the bait you dropped, which is cars aren't the right autonomous vehicles. What is? Our perspective is uh, there's really two pieces to it that are important to consider. One, the autonomous vehicle manufacturers are not working towards a common standard. Number two, they're sharing the road with lots of people who are not driving autonomous vehicles. There are just many, many challenges to overcome before we see that being truly a practical reality. However, when you think about X, Y, and Z, the Z axis is above us. It's not on the roads. It's using a new digital infrastructure. And below, you know, below national airspace, from the shoelaces to national airspace, is really a much safer testing ground for working out the the digital infrastructure that's going to be required to, let's say, we know that drone delivery is going to happen eventually. We think drone taxis will at some point way in the future. But for now, we are focused on solving the problems with a, with a very realistic use case, and that is autonomously controlled drones. We call them robots because we uh, they are not manually flown. We have an autopilot flight engine. We design missions, and these missions are executed on construction sites or on cell tower inspections or on infrastructure that needs to be inspected prior to being uh, constructed or torn down. You, you know, America got a D plus in their infrastructure just recently, and one out of not, not every nine bridges is structurally deficient. They all have to be inspected before they can be shovel-ready products. Uh, so I was going to say, so what, what you're what you're describing to me is a spatial platform, exactly. Right, where drones, where because you know I you know I've seen some like drone racing league stuff where it's like a car in the air. You're really piloting a plane as a you know a drone for a quadcopter as a plane. But what you're describing to me is much more of a uh, you know, of, of an XYZ access platform from a robotics perspective that takes on a specific move here, move here, move here position. And then the platform is, is accurate enough that you could actually write a, you know, a spatial program to move, move your platform into different locations. Is that, is that sort of what you're, how you're describing it? That, that is a very effective uh, way to also describe it. We, okay. 
are, are doing just that, but we stamp out mission plans. These are, you know, sets of instructions that are executed by the drone, which makes it a robot, not a drone. It's not manually flown anymore. We believe that we'll be seeing things like an autonomy waiver from the FAA in short order. We will see, you know, thousands of these drones doing what we call the dull, the dangerous, the demanding, and, and the difficult. For listeners, robots typically, uh, for, for you know, 30 years, this is how you define good work for robots, is with the, the difficult, dangerous, high degrees of repeatability, dull tasks. Typically, you know, when I, <laughs> I did, I have a master's in industrial engineering for robotics specifically, and so we would, you know, you have a cage and you have a safe space and things like that. What, what we're describing with these drones, these robotic drones, is they are programmatically controlled to work within a, a very constrained uh, zone of operations, and they have a tight, I'm assuming a tight feedback loop from that perspective. That's the reason for the edge, the low latency. And so it's, it's very different than what you might see somebody, you know, hobbyist flying in a park, want, you know, staring at an iPad while they move a camera platform around. You're, you're describing, how, are you, how is what you're describing different from, from that? The operator, the Part 107 uh, certified operator in our model is really a safety officer. He's not controlling the drone. The drone is controlled by the autopilot application that's running on the iOS or mobile device. All of the instructions are executed using the virtual stick SDK from DJI. And so then the drone, the drone has a program it executes. Do you then take external additional, like external cameras to monitor the drone behavior or is the drone you know, autonomous from that perspective? Well, we always have a view on the app of what the drone is doing. We can also see the, the path of the drone that it will be taking and the waypoints. Not only does our autopilot application suite control, controls the drone, the flight operations, it also controls the gimbal and it controls all of the camera settings. And that's where we are delivering to our customers what is known as 4D visual insights packaged up in an interface for construction called job site. It's temporal so that if you're capturing your job weekly, you have these four 360s, you have an image series that goes around the outside that sort of forms like a very high resolution decomposed video that you can scrub through. It's designed for machine learning to be able to do things like object identification, counting, uh, change detection, safety inspections, quality inspections, and all this is packaged up into a very user-friendly interface that uh, our customers are just really digging it. And it's because the, the images are captured exactly the same way by the autonomous mission, puts it into a cognitive con context that makes just a ton of sense and it's real easy to get benefits out of it. Wow, right, because you have the re reproducibility, you have the exactness. And from a cost perspective, actually, you're capturing images that no, but no human could actually capture, which is one of the things I like about a robotic, a good robotic application that, you know, is doing things with a precision and a repeatability and a time scale that humans can't match, which this is exactly that. You're right. You're right. And, we, and then do you, would you coordinate multiple drones? So could you have a fleet and take operations where the mission would be a, you know, a 10 drone fleet so that you could cover something more quickly or you could get multiple perspectives on objects? You can when the FAA says you can. <laughs> Got it. Uh, you know, you've seen, you know, the drones capturing the image of the drone capturing the image, you know, those kinds of things. Yes. But normally oh, yeah. that requires one operator per aircraft. I would, I would like to mention that as I, I called it a robotics as a system, it's really important because it is a system of systems. We have already gone through the process with the FAA. We have more waivers and authorization than over 400 than any other company in the US. We integrate with uh, drone networks like Measure and, and uh, Drone Base so we can send someone out for you if you don't wanna capture the stuff on your own. We also have all of the transforms, we're not in the photogrammetry business, but we've integrated with Pix4D and with uh, Maps Made Easy, and we can deliver about 33 different data types back into the viewer autonomously. 
and we are doing a lot of work with some leading data scientists on some labeled data sets for machine learning. Wow. So there's, it's not just controlling the drones and making the drones go. It's actually how you express the data and how you process it. You keep mentioning Kinetic Edge, and I keep stopping you and asking more questions. Define Kinetic Edge for me. From, from our context, it's the next evolution for sure. You know, okay. as, as we begin to get this processing power out at the edge, then we're going to be able to do all kinds of much more interesting things very quickly. Um, I can see, so we do have a video, and I, I would hope that, uh, that your listeners will be able to take a look at that. Our vision for it today is that we will have vapor, we'll have vapor chain chambers at the Crown Castle tower locations. These will have pretty much bare metal. They'll have all of the different cloud providers will be present in these vapor chambers. We're working with uh, Vapor now to do five in Chicago. There are, I think there are three now in place. Five will cover the entire city. We will have drones stationed at those towers and those drones will be able to autonomously execute a mission to inspect a nearby construction site or to inspect a few cell towers that are nearby and return uh, to that location. We have high speed ingest that allows us to get these 30 to 100 gigabyte uh, sets of data off of the aircraft and into the processing engines of, our, of Hangar Solution. Put more of the machine learning, those things that might be uh, more important at the edge, like uh, a true safety issue that is immediately dangerous that could get pushed right back out to the project manager or the superintendent for the Wrigley Field construction project, for example. We have the other capabilities that the Kinetic Edge brings us, which is microlocation and microclimate. And both of those environmental variables are going to be critical for having thousands of robots flying over our cities. What do you mean by microlocation? The GPSs that are, exist for commercial use are really very good, but they're not good enough. And microlocation, particularly the flavor that we're pursuing with a company called Humatics, and this, this is public, so it's, it's uh, feel free to go take a look at those guys. They provide a set of sensors that can give us millimeter accuracy on the X, Y, and Z planes or where the aircraft is. So we can get in closer to facades of buildings and we can just navigate with much more precision and much more uh, autonomy. And we can be aware of other aircraft that are in the air around us. It's, it begins to get us into a true UTM environment. In these cases, what you're saying is, is that we've got super precise, based on current, right, super precise locations of an aircraft or a robotic platform. And then that robotic platform is talking back to an edge data center. So low latency where, where there's basically an application that's, that's air traffic control. Or are the aircraft able to talk to each other and share, share location with high resolution? Where, where does, where does, you know, where's the net, where's the communication taking place? All of the communication is going to be going back over LTE or 5G to, you know, to a, a flight controller. Okay. But the, we, we also have partners in this equation that have some very uh, powerful, unique X-band radars that will be, I, we believe they'll be placed near the airports, near the uh, life flight helipads, things like that. So in order to be as safe as possible integrating with the national airspace, these radars will tell us to stand down anytime there is a manned aircraft or another aircraft nearby that, it, that we might present a hazard. Wow. Let me break that down and make sure, make sure I'm understanding, because this is, this is a great edge use case. In, in the case you're describing, we have a sensor field where we have the location, the, the self, self-determined location of the aircraft feeding back to an edge data center which also gets feeds of regional radars that provide additional sense uh, data, additional alerts and telemetry. The aircraft might be flying in a space where it has its own 
data, radars, location information, visual field, things like that. It sends those back to the data center to be processed, but it, can, it, it augments the, the flight control computer, augments the drone's field of view, if you will, or, or sensor information with regional sensors that that drone is in, in presence of. So it's dramatically expanded. It's the data that the flight computer can take in, in, into account while the drone is flying. Is that, a, is that right? That is, it's, okay. it's that they, we, ha we can share the mission, the flight plan, and the, the radar system that we are working to integrate with will be, it will know when those trajectories come within a, a, a certain threshold, and then it will tell our flight controller to stand down. Could you even like start bringing in like you know a storm front you know uh, weather's coming through? You could actually get wind information That's, from drones in the area and then start making adjustments as as a front comes through or something like that. Is it are we getting that level of accuracy? Our partner Climacell will be present at the edge as well, and that's what they do is microclimate. Now we'll know before we execute a mission, and these missions are often constrained by battery life, but we'll know if we have no business being in the air for the next 10 minutes before yeah. we ever execute the mission. So that's the humatics and the Climacell and the vapor and us all at the edge. And that's what we think, that's what makes it connect. That's why you need the kinetic. Okay. So, I, and I want to highlight something that, that may be obvious, but is worth really drilling into. Because you mentioned batteries, right? There is a physics limitation here, and it applies to cars too, um, but especially to drones. You can't put more and more complex computers or more and more complex radars into these, into these drones, right? It, it, it has a significant, every, every ounce of payload impacts that mission. That's right. And, and so being able to offload computational tasks into more generic compute infrastructure, you know, translates into in improved mission uh, performance. That's exactly right. And, and we are unique in the way we've viewed this. We, if you look at the other companies in this space, typically they're doing orthomosaic mapping, fairly simple tasks like that. And they just upload the mission to the drone. We do not. We have the the application is running on our devices on that mobile devices, and uh, it gives us so much more power and control. Exactly as you said. Okay. So in, in this case, and then it then it becomes a software problem. You can ex, you can field patch software to say, okay, I've got an additional sense. So if somebody showed up with a uh, laser ranging and said, okay, I, I want you to get within you know three millimeters of the of the surface of this building then you could, you know, and you said, well, you need a laser ranging device so that I have better, better geo positioning than I have, than I can get. So could somebody add sensors into that network and, and basically improve the, 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 the mission map? Well, our first step is with the, is with humatics and the micro location, okay. but you know, the sensors are becoming more and more uh, sensitive and some of the CV work that's coming out in the new drones, it'll get us close. I don't think you ever want to get that close to a building just because there are <laughs> of wind. But, you know, you do the same thing with some of these really punched in zoom cameras. As long as the, the flight controller is controlling the camera settings, well, you're golden. That makes a lot of sense. You could do yeah, some dynamic mission updates. You could have, a, you know, air, aircraft. So in, in a... In an airport case, you could literally have drones that drop to the ground if there's incoming aircraft automatically. So you can, you can actually, because you're doing an interactive loop in the mission plan, you can count on external influences that are happening in real time. That as long as there is a sensor that can notify us, yes, that's our, that's our vision and our plan with the kinetic edge. Okay, so in this case, these, these edge infrastructures become many data centers, but very software integrated pieces. So you've identified a use case that we've been talking about on, on other podcasts of this multi-source data into an edge data center. Is that, is, is that how you, how would you describe that's, that? Is that the kinetic edge? That's exactly what Matt and I talk about. From that perspective, this isn't a single vendor. You're, you know, you're not doing all this drone stuff yourself. You, every time you talk, you're saying, I've got three vendors that I'm working with. I've got 10 output formats. Yes. Um, how do we build a marketplace 
for that type of collaboration? That seems like heavy lift. What Hangar has done from the beginning is built a system that is designed from the ground up to serve the ecosystem. I mean, you hear questions about, is it really a platform? And what really makes it a platform? Well, in our world, we believe that all that's important for the end user and, and to transform industries is to be able to recognize that there's data that's valuable, to be able to request it, and to be able to receive it. Not hassling with the drone uh, division, not hassling with FAA waivers, not hassling with planning missions, you know, not finding which photogrammetry provider you want to use, not using Dropbox or Box. It, <laughs> it's just about asking for the data and getting the data back and we'll take care of the rest in it. And we count on partners and that's why we built the robust API for, for many different parts of our platform. So how do you, how do you go about building that coalition? Uh, painting the vision. It starts with painting the vision of what's possible and building the technology toward that vision and working with the FAA to try to get them to understand that, that we are concerned about safe integration and safe operations and respect their concerns. And just, uh, we, we are engineering technology. We're also doing our very best to engineer society's understanding of the benefits of this technology. It's, it's, a, it's a big nut to crack, but we're, we're working on it piece by piece, day by day. So one of the things that you're saying is, is compelling to me, and it would be just as much for autonomous cars, there are government safety regulations in this. So if I want to do a drone application, you know, what, what, you're, what I'm hearing from you is, yeah, don't, don't, you don't mess with the drone platform. Worry about what you're trying to get it to do. So you would talk to somebody who's like, I want to do building inspections or site inspections. Uh, and I have an, a machine learning protocol I want to run against the machine to make sure that I'm counting the number of uh, litter, not a litter somebody's left behind, right? Come with your application. Don't try to fly the drones. You're going to run into an, an FAA. You know, you're going to have to deal with the FAA. We've done that. Use our platform. Is that, is that sort of the, the message here? That is part of it, and, and you're, you're so close to the real heart of it. We, we have been working for a while with what we call AIMS, that's the Autonomous Mission Execution Standard. And we believe, so, so what we do is we abstracted the hardware SDK and the Apple SDK, and then we've layered on a mission kit, we call it, and then there's the hangar kit, and then on top of that, you can build any kind of viewer that you want. So if you know how much firmware upgrades there are in this world of <laughs> flying robots to have to not have to have every single vendor out there keeping abreast with all these firmware changes by pulling this all up to a level that developers can interact with and build other software applications for it we're trying to lead the way so that we can maybe get some rational thinking about how the cars have to work together on a standard because what happens when a Volvo and a Tesla and a GM have an autonomous accident? Who, who's at right. who's fault? I went on a bit long about that. No, it's, no it, makes, it makes perfect sense. And I, and I think you know, as we have these edge discussions, the protocols and how edge, the multi-vendor component of this, both from a device, right, the drone, the cars, the, you know, these platforms, and the edge data itself, because they're going to be multi-vendor platforms. You mentioned like you know, all the major cloud vendors having a presence in every edge data center. There's a tremendous need for us to be able to exchange data in a, in a safe, predictable way. Right. And so that's, that's, why, that's why I like these questions, because I, I, I'm interested in how you are thinking through communicating the message of, we need to play along together, right? We need to build an ecosystem. Right. Well, we've seen the, at least in the drone industry, if you've watched what's happened from investments and things like that, it, those who try to go it alone have found the going quite difficult. So does that mean like building a vertical stack or what is, what is going it alone? Yeah. Well, yeah, sure. There, there are a few companies who've raised 
hundreds of millions of dollars and they wanted to control every bit of it. They built their own drone, they built their own flight stack. They, you know, they, they went all in with a hardware focus was the primary mistake most of them made. We bet early on that DJI was gonna be the dominant player. The impact is too large. We, we have to reach out to, to all of the drone service providers, to the other you know, application users, like it's, whether it's ag or whether it's aggregates or whether it's construction, infrastructure, you name it. I mean, anything that needs to be inspected is gonna be much more safely done so and much more thoroughly done so with the uh, up close and personal autonomous robot. I think that there's a lot more things that people need inspected than they realize <laughs> are inspected just because of costs. Well, man, yeah, you there's just, a Jevons paradox operating, I think, in this case. If you just look at construction alone, and when I say that, I also mean heavy and civil infrastructure. This, this universe is, is about 4% of the work population, yet they have over 20% of the fatalities in the workplace. And it, most of the 13 people lose their lives on a construction site every day in America, and 50% of those are because they fall from six feet or higher. And that's just sad. If we took a lot of those aerial tasks away, we're improving safety immediately. Absolutely. Right, I, I, and then, yeah, a lot of these cases, I think the safety case is gonna drive autonomous cars faster than, than the, the business function case. From a government perspective, those are very powerful arguments. Yeah, and the, the, tr truthfully, all of the multi-billion dollar building companies uh, feel the same way. I mean, safety is their number one priority. Right, right. And also, I think you do get a financial benefit. Inspections are a cost compared to, and I, this is actually funny because software is the same thing. We have, a, we have a problem getting people to pay for tests and building test, test automation mm -hmm. uh, because those are safeties in a lot of cases. And we, we, so we want to we want to optimize the building, automate the testing. And we're, you're making the exact same argument, yep. um, which I think is is really interesting. And then it'll be fun with uh, combining autonomous cars and drones because you can do road inspections and validations and things like that very quickly. I guess cars can do that themselves; they have their own cameras. But yeah, um, but you know, it's pretty expensive to have 16 super supercomputers on a car that's going to sell for less than twenty thousand bucks. So do you think that cars basically are going to go through the same process? We're, we're going to offload a lot of the processing that the car has to carry to edge, the kinetic edge? Well, it would seem logical, but I know there are going to be those that are always going to be worried most about the, the times when you've lost connectivity. Uh, I'm not an expert in, in that particular field, so I'd have to... I have to leave that to uh, some of the automotive guys to be sure. It seems logical. 5G is going to be much more uh, common, particularly in the smart city initiatives. You know, we're, we're looking at some of those, some of the things that are being done in Singapore, some of the things that are being done in Denver and Chicago, and where, where that smart city is already appreciated somewhat. I think those are going to want, those are going to be the places where we can prove out our economic and safety value propositions most readily. It feels to me, and this is one of Matt's points, is that the idea of what you're doing with drones and the, the battery limitations, right, they're electric vehicles. You know, as we move to autonomous, autonomous will almost certainly be electric uh, vehicles also spending a lot of the charge potential, the range potential, the, the mission potential on running computers that are redundant with edge, you know, at that, at that point, those, those become high cost items compared to what you could offload. Yeah, uh, that's, right. that's right. And even if you just turn them off because inside of a smart city, you don't need them, you would get the range back, although you'd still have the cost. Um, yeah, you're still, fi fixed cameras versus those that can reposition themselves easily is, is still there's a great benefit in being able to move around uh, that's why we focus only on mobile robotics those that can change their location 100 percent. interesting I, yeah because this was the thing that would be interesting to me 
from an edge, edge computation perspective is being able to, to drop a, a fixed camera onto a job site and then have the data that it's collecting as it watches the drones do their action feed back into that system. Strikes me as a logical extension, but it didn't seem as exciting to you. There are use cases that we're involved in. Uh, there's a, a number of very large contracts out to seek alternatives for uh, a border wall, for example, that's sensor-based and can dispatch drones to go do investigations all along, and it's a lot cheaper to do it that way. There are also uh, illegal fishing initiatives whereby even, even satellite imagery can, can tell if a boat is doing something that it wasn't communicated that it was going to be doing, and then that can deploy a drone from a port to go get at least the ID number off the boat. Uh, I mean, the, the sensor integration is absolutely part of our vision. Uh, it's just, we're working through some very interesting use cases right now. That makes, this is actually a good sort of, I think, closing, I'm, I'm watching time, Stephen, sort of a closing thought here is that, you know, what you're describing, as much as we've got edge and edge infrastructure and offload, we're still not looking, you know, we're still not all the way to an integrated an aggregated sensor platform, uh, those are going to have additional hurdles. We're, 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 we're still at the early stages in, in that type of, of thinking, it sounds to me. Well, we're, we're doing what we can with the X-band radar, with the millimeter uh, microlocation, and with the climate, climate cell. We, we feel like we're solving those problems, pushing the industry to th at least think about these other problems, and hopefully we'll have some demonstrative ways to show that it, they're not unsurmountable. I think that's awesome. Because that's that to me is the exciting, when edge starts getting really exciting, it's when we're starting to share data between these different platforms, right? That's you're, 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 you're getting, you're there uh, in building these partnerships and we're starting to build things. It's going to make it a different, and right. that, that's one of the things that's going to differentiate edge, in my opinion. Um, sounds like you're, you're, you're already there. Violent uh, agreement. Awesome. Richard, this is uh, Steven Spector again. If any of our listeners were interested in learning more, uh, following you on social media or anything like that, where should they go to? Hangar.com and all of our social links are there and all of the, we've got a great library of videos and blog posts and it's all right there. It's all right there. Well, Richard, I appreciate you joining us. It was uh, this is a good change of pace to talk robotics. And I don't know how many people knew Rob knew so much about robotics. So that was a learning lesson for me as well. But uh, thanks to both of you today and uh, look forward to talking to you guys again. Thank you. My pleasure. Bye-bye.